So personally, it took me quite a while to realize that regional anesthesia for hip pain is actually quite a complicated topic. What really brought it home for me was trying to improve analgesia in hip arthroscopy. Many of these patients are relatively young, often athletic, and many of them would have significant pain in the PACU, despite what on the surface would appear to be minimally invasive surgery. Now, at the same time, there would be those who had comparatively little pain. And our experiments with different blocks also failed to make a consistent impact, at least anecdotally. At the other end of the patient spectrum, we have the frail elderly patient with a broken hip. And somewhere in the middle, the patient for an elective total hip replacement. Even among these patients, though, we see significant variability between individuals in the degree of pain they experience and the amount of opioid analgesia that they require. The thing to remember is that pain itself is more than skin deep. We often fixate on cutaneous innovation because that is what is emphasized most often in textbooks, but pain can come from trauma to muscles, ligaments, and bone, as I think all of us can attest to from our own various bumps and knocks. So in planning your regional analgesic approach, always ask yourself, what deeper structures apart from skin are likely to be producing the pain? As I've said, hip arthroscopy exemplifies this for me. Incisional pain is a relatively small component, and instead most of the trauma is to the capsular and intracapsular connective tissue and the articular surfaces of the joint. Another often overlooked component is the muscular and ligamentous pain that results from the prolonged traction these patients are placed into as part of the surgery. Even abdominal pain from fluid extravasation has been reported, although this is uncommon. Now each of these different structures has its own innervation and these are supplied by multiple nerves. Even if we just consider skin innervation, we can see that it's a lot more complex than we think. Many of us think only of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, but in reality, many of the more proximal incisions are supplied by lateral branches of the subcostal or T12 nerve, the ilohypogastric nerve, and also the superior clunial nerves. The clunial nerves are branches of the dorsal rami of the L1 to L3 spinal nerves, and this may explain why blocks such as the lumbar ESP and quadratus lumbarum blocks have been reported to work in hip surgeries. The gluteal muscles and tensor fascia lata are supplied by the superior and inferior gluteal nerves, which are also branches of L4-5 and S1, but the ventral rami in this case. More familiar to us are the femoral and obturator nerves. Depending on the exact condition, muscular branches to the iliopsoas and quadriceps muscles by the femoral nerve may also be important mediators of pain. Finally, the obturator, femoral, and sciatic nerves have articular branches that innervate the hip joint and capsule, as well as osseous branches to the femur and acetabulum. Now, different surgeries and scenarios also call for different blocks. As a good example, the choice of block in the hip fracture patient is also influenced by whether we are doing this to provide preoperative analgesia and opioid sparing while awaiting surgery, or whether we're doing this in the operating room perhaps to provide analgesia for positioning for a spinal, or more importantly, for post-operative analgesia. The considerations are quite different. In the preoperative phase, much of the pain comes with movement related to the bony fracture itself. There can also be pain from associated muscle trauma and spasm, which explains why younger and fitter patients with better musculature will have more pain than the deconditioned 90-year-old. Cutaneous anesthesia such as that provided by a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block is irrelevant. An ambulation is not a goal, so motor block as a side effect is also less relevant. On the other hand, blocks in the intraoperative phase must take into account the actual surgical incision and trauma and the fact that postoperative mobilization will be an important goal. There are several different operations that can be done to repair a fractured hip, and they involve quite different skin incisions, muscular dissections, and bony instrumentation. The source of pain in each will therefore be quite different. So, along with the multitude of nerves that innervate the hip region, we also have a multitude of nerve blocks to choose from. Athma will shortly be demonstrating most of them to you, but here's an overview. So moving from central to peripheral, we have a spinal or epidural, then we have a lumbar plexus block, which has largely fallen out of favor due to a perception that its risks and complications outweigh its benefit. And then we have what I'm going to call lumbar plexus blocks by proxy, although this is somewhat controversial. This would include quadratus lumborum blocks, particularly the anterior or transmuscular QL block, 
and the Lumber ESP block. As I mentioned earlier, these may owe part of their claimed efficacy to anesthesia of the lumbar dorsal rami and the superior clunial nerves. I also want to note that there are now quite a few RCTs of lumbar ESP in spine surgery, and none of these report sensory or motor block of the lower limbs as complications. So it does make me wonder how much of a lumbar plexus effect there really is. Now the sciatic nerve is not usually targeted because of the motor block that usually accompanies it. Instead, we usually target the branches of the lumbar plexus, lateral femoral nerve, femoral nerve, and obturator nerve. We are often chiefly interested in the articular branches of these nerves, hence the development of the ping block and related subpectineal and iliopsoas plane injections, which target these specific terminal branches. I want to spend a moment specifically on the femoral nerve block and fascia iliaca block, and I, I discuss my take on these closely related techniques in a video on my YouTube channel. The fascia iliaca block evolved as a safe landmark guided technique that allowed practitioners to deliver local anesthetic to the lumbar plexus and femoral nerve without a nerve stimulator or in those days ultrasound. And now that ultrasound guidance is almost ubiquitous, I often ask myself why we choose to use this specific lateral site of injection and to target a fascial plane instead of the actual nerves that we are interested in. It may still be safer and easier for novices, but I want to highlight a couple of principles that I believe are fundamental to optimal block performance, particularly in hip fracture analgesia. First, we need to target the articular branches of the femoral nerve and ideally also the obturator nerve. Also the branches of the femoral nerve innervating the femoral shaft and the muscles that may be injured or in spasm. These are the iliopsoas muscle and the quadriceps. To do this most effectively, we must aim to get local anesthetic spread superior to the inguinal ligament and into the pelvic area. We could use a supraingrinal skin puncture site, but if we're using an infrainguinal approach to either the femoral or fascia iliaca block, then we must direct our needle from caudal to cranial. And second, we must jet a high volume of local anesthetic into the supraingrinal location to maximize the chance of reaching all the relevant nerves. And these are the same principles that I use when placing a catheter, always aiming to thread it cranially so that the tip ends up in the supraingrinal location. I'm going to throw in a related pearl regarding sonographic identification of the femoral nerve. In most patients, the femoral nerve is an elongated elliptical structure that is 1 to 2 centimeters lateral to the artery. In certain individuals, however, the femoral nerve can actually be dis displaced medially to lie very close and almost under the femoral artery. In this example, it would be easy to mistake the area lateral to the artery as the femoral nerve. But in reality, the nerve has been pushed medially to lie right next to the artery. The key here is always to start by identifying the iliopsoas muscle and then it's covering fascia iliaca and then tracing it medially where it dives under the artery. The probe is tilted and slid to increase echogenicity of the nerve. Now, this phenomenon is most often seen in individuals with very well-developed muscles where the hypertrophied iliopsoas pushes the nerve medially. This is the thigh of a keen cyclist, and again, you can see that the femoral nerve is not immediately obvious. The femoral artery is identified as is the dark hypoechoic iliopsoas muscle, which is more of a rectangular rather than a triangular shape here, indicating hypertrophy. The fascia lata and iliaca are also readily identified and knowing that the nerve lies under fascia iliaca and on top of iliopsoas, it becomes clear that the femoral nerve is the structure immediately next to the artery and even partially under it on the right side. I'm going to end by saying that it's really up for discussion as to what block or combinations of blocks are optimal in any given setting, and we'll address this towards the end of this session. For now, I will say that although RCTs will provide us with the best evidence on which to base our choice, we should look carefully at the design of each study to decide if it's truly generalizable and applicable to our specific patient. In the absence of high quality comparative trials, we should apply reason and logic, coupled with accurate and detailed anatomical knowledge in making our choices. And ultimately, all decision making should be tailored to each individual patient.